Hi folks, I am in yet another hotel room, but this time in San Francisco, where I've been for the entire week doing almost back-to-back -back meetings on Have I Been Pwned and Project Svalbard stuff, which I want to talk about in a moment and give as much insight as I can into what's going on because it's actually an enormously interesting process. But I thought I'd cover some of the sort of normal business as usual stuff first and then I'll, I don't even know how long I'll go on for on that. Uh, and in case you're not watching this on the video, I am abnormally well dressed. I have a shirt, which I am going to start loosening off a little bit if I'm honest, because it has been just one of those weeks where it's one of those rare occasions where being presentable is actually very important. So let me start with this uh, business as usual sort of stuff, data breaches. I have been loading a heap of data breaches over the last week. I think I must have done a bunch on the weekend because I've pretty much been flat chat the last few days. But I had so much data given to me, particularly whilst I was in Norway, that I'm just sort of working through that backlog. And then just as I thought I was starting to get on top of it, even more data keeps getting sent to me and I'm behind the eight ball. Again, we're going to talk about that and the problem and how I'm solving it with this whole have I been pwned acquisition stuff in just a moment. So let me just go through the mechanics of this. Uh, number one. <laughs> Where do I even begin? Let's begin at the beginning. Chronologically, since I guess one week ago when I last did this video. Uh, actually, where, where did I finish this one? I can't remember the last one I talked about. Doesn't matter. There's a lot of them. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. Roll 20. Uh, tabletop role playing game. So Roll 20 had 4 million records breached in December. That was one of these ones which was in the press a little bit earlier this month. Obviously the data is now starting to circulate around. Uh, Bcrypt password hash is good. Last four digits of the credit card, bad. Remember, last four digits of the credit card, okay, you can't actually make a transaction based on the last four digits, but the last four digits are also often used as identity verification questions. So it's a little bit more serious than just, you know, it's only partial card number, you can't do anything with it. So uh, they're in there. 70% of those email addresses were already in Have I Been Pwned. Armour Games, this is one that Armour did disclose a little bit earlier on, I think this year, because it looks like the, uh, the Tech Raptor article that I've linked through to was from back in January. 10.6 million accounts, 71% of those were already in Have I Been Pwned. Uh, Salted Sha1 hashes too, which is not a very good look at this time in this place. So uh, that's no good. Now, what else we got in here? We've got uh, Game Salad. 1.5 million accounts compromised in February. IP addresses, usernames, passwords stored as sheltered SHA-256 hashes, which is also just about useless as well. Frankly, unless it's bcrypt or pbkdf2 or some sort of adaptive hashing algorithm these days, it's gonna be pretty terrible. Now, actually, that said, one thing worth pointing out is even if, let's say it's like just MD5 with no salt. MD5 with no salt, if you're generating super good, high quality passwords out of a password manager, and we're talking about dozens and dozens of genuinely random, genuinely random, pseudo random characters, no one in any sort of reasonable capacity is gonna be cracking that anyway. The problem is it's pretty much only you and me that does that. Uh, and in fact, I did get some interesting stats I shared this week. So Shape Security, uh, who is sponsoring my blog this week, we'll talk about Shape in a moment. I put out a tweet a little while ago, maybe a week ago, and I said, does anyone have any figures on what percentage of people are using password managers? So for example, you're running some sort of large web asset people log on to, uh, are you able to profile who is using a password manager and who is not? Shape Security, because they sit there and they do a whole bunch of things like credential stuffing prevention on a bunch of big websites, do actually sit in the authentication process or the authentication process flow the login bits, and they were able to get these stats. And there are a couple little nuances here. I'll actually try and remember to link to the tweet, but in, in a nutshell, it was like less than 1% of people using a password manager. So the point about the MD5 thing is that you and I are probably fine because we're generating good passwords. The other like 99 point something percent of people not so fine because they're not using a password manager and you know what that means when it comes to password practices. All right, so Game Salad, yeah, SHA-256. Stronghold Kingdom, another gaming site. 5.2 million accounts compromised July last year. Email addresses, usernames, passwords, stored as salted SHA-1 hashes. 57% already in Have I Been Pwned. 
why do we keep having this issue with like stupid... I'm going to actually talk about this in a moment, about why we keep having this issue with stupidly bad password hashing algorithms. Flash Flash Revolution. 1.9 million accounts compromised last week. And in fact, this one popped up on a very popular hacking forum. A number of people contacted me and went, there it is, also here it is, <laughs> handed me over the data. Uh, now, this was actually a subsequent data breach because they were breached back in 2016. And I mean, this is the, the frustrating thing about it. 2016, they had a data breach. They had MD5 password hashes in 2016. What do you reckon they got in 2019? MD5 password hashes. Usernames, dates of birth. Why do you need dates of birth? It's a game. Here's an interesting anecdote. I often say this to people. It's like, don't collect dates of birth on a website like that one because you don't need it. You know, like practice data minimization, this sort of thing. And I'll say this on Twitter, and people will reply to me and they'll say, well, actually, you need date of birth because of COPPA, the Child Online Protection Act here in the US. You know, you've got to make sure people are 13 in order to sign up to the service. And I'll say to them, I'll say, all right, how about this? Why don't you ask them, are you 13? And then if yes, continue to the service. If no, then don't. And I kid you not, the answer I've had many times from people is I've said, they could lie. <laughs> like, yeah, well, they could lie on their date of birth as well. So all you've done is you've not improved security in any measurable way. And it's not even security. You've not addressed copper in any practical measurable way. And all you've done now is you put a whole bunch of people at risk because dates of birth are knowledge-based authentication questions. Static KBA at that because you can't change it. So the MD5 situation. It frustrates the hell out of me because... MD5 has been bad for many, many, many years. In fact, I remember writing about how Salted SHA-1 was bad in, I think, 2012. Uh, if you Google Troy Hunt No Clothes, <laughs> true story, there's a blog post I wrote uh, titled something along the lines of our password hashing has no clothes. And I was trying to illustrate just how fast I could crack hashes using general consumer grade hardware running at home, just a good fast GPU. And it sort of illustrated that anything stored as a SHA-1 hash, salt or no salt, even in 2012, was kind of terrible. So to be here seven years down the line and not have fixed this, even after a data breach, it's just crazy. I suspect a lot of organisations are in the mindset of it won't happen to me, so why should I bother? I'm investing in something which isn't a new feature or returning immediate business value or whatever justification you put on it. And of course, the problem is that once there's a data breach, it's like, well, th that horse is bolted. It's too late. You can't now change your hashing algorithm. So that was frustrating. Uh, an old breach here, uh, Xiaomi, Xiaomi, Chinese name, had 7 million email addresses breached in 2012. Um, MD5 password hashes. I'm less upset about the fact that a 2012 data breach had MD5 than I am about a 2019 data breach having MD5. Oh, also on that flash flash revolution, because it was the second data breach, 98% of the audience had already been in Have I Been Pwned. Uh, the Chinese one just here, 7%. Now also there are a bunch of like generated email addresses in here. So I'm, I don't put a huge amount of faith in the accuracy of that 7 million number. Uh, it's accurate insofar as there were 7 million unique email addresses but it looks like a bunch of them were generated for people. So it might not be representative of 7 million normal everyday Chinese email addresses. So that's, uh, that's everything to date. I've got a bunch of stuff I'm still working through and I'm just going to have to see how I go with it. Um, I, I tend to end up doing stuff in hotel rooms, but also I'm, I'm looking out the window in San Fran at the moment and the sun's out. And my watch says, well, it's down to nine now. My watch was saying it was a UV index of 10, which actually sounded like a nice, uh, nice time to be out in the sun. So anyway, that's the new data breaches. Now, continuing the Have I Been Pwned theme, just over a week ago, I added an auth tier to the API. And last week, I explained all the reasons why I did that. So I won't recap on this now. What I can talk about now is what I have seen in the last week. And there's two things I've seen which I was hoping I've seen. Let me rephrase that. It's been such a long week. There are two things I've seen which I was hoping that I would see 
there's one thing I haven't seen which I was worried I'd see, and there's a new thing I've seen which I had never thought I'd see, or I wouldn't see the value in. So let me go through those in, in that order. So the first thing I was hoping is that I would be able to massively improve the reliability of the API insofar as not having more false positives of good people being blocked by the behavior of bad people. So bad people are those using the API outside acceptable use terms, abusing it, enumerating through massive amounts of email addresses across a spread of different IP addresses. Uh, I would try and apply Cloudflare rules in a very, fairly sort of blunt fashion. So, you know, one ASN, so one network with a lot of different IP addresses being abusive. Okay, ban hammer on the network for a while. That blocked good people doing good things. Now, I have not had a single report of anyone with an API key getting blocked because all those Cloudflare rules don't apply to the API key. They only apply to the old API path, the V2 path. And then, of course, it's like applying to randos on the internet who I have no idea who they are. So everyone with an API key, to the best of my knowledge, <laughs> caveat out there, to contact me and tell me if I'm wrong, to the best of my knowledge, has not had a single request blocked that shouldn't have been. Now, of course, they will get HTTP 429 if they're making too many requests, and that seems to be ticking along very nicely. So that's expected thing number one. Expected thing number two is that I'm seeing the rates of abuse now starting to rapidly drop. I've not seen any evidence of abuse whatsoever on v3 of the API, and I'm just clamping down firewall rules harder on v2 of the API. Now that inevitably is still going to be blocking some legitimate traffic, but the response that comes back from that firewall rule literally says, hey, you've been blocked, there might be someone else bad on the network, maybe you're not a bad person. Here's the blog post about the V3 API, go over there, get yourself an API key job done. So I'm very happy about that. The thing I haven't seen, I haven't seen any attempts to get really pissed off at me and start doing malicious things in terms of just like DDoS or mass enumeration attempts of the API or anything like that. And I, I suspect it's partly because of the previous point where now when I'm seeing patterns which just aren't cool, I just go, all right, ban hammer, go and get a V3 API key. So I'm happy about that as well. And then the fourth thing that I'm really happy about, and I honestly, and some people will be suspicious when I say this, but honestly, I had never thought about this beforehand, is because people are now purchasing an API key and that purchase goes into Stripe and people go into Stripe as a customer, I can actually see who's using the API. I never had visibility into who was using that free API before. And I'm sure, <laughs> given the week that I've just had where everyone's sort of talking about what are the opportunities with the service, I'm sure many people would have said, hey, we'd really like to know who's using this service in, in a large scale fashion and they're a big organization. I never knew this before, I do know this now. So it's really interesting to see the names of organizations, government departments using the API, the, I'm doing air quotes, free API, because I know it's not free, you've got to pay the $3.50, but it's effectively net zero for me because I don't make any money out of it, it basically just covers costs. So it's really interesting now to see the names. And, and that's actually super cool. Uh, and the, the the main reason it's super cool is just this little geeky bit within me, which is like, isn't it awesome to see big recognizable brands getting value out of this thing? You know, and again, for all intents and purposes, it's a free service. Jeez, I'm spending a lot more than $3.50 just for a cup of coffee here at the moment. So it's basically a free service, but it's just super cool to see those organizations. Now, uh, that was the API stuff. Oh, last thing on the API. I did tweet out a figure a couple of days ago. I said about 38% of requests to the API are now going to V3 with the auth instead of V2. That number when I checked it today was up to about 44%. And the, the way I'm assessing this as well is I'm just taking a slice of traffic from the Cloudflare Edge node log, so about the last one hour of traffic, and going, okay, wh what's the spread between V2 and V3? And that's it. So I'm very happy to see that ticking up and I'm very happy to see a constant flow of people actually getting themselves one of these keys and making sure their access is reliable. All right, so the interesting bit. Project Svalbar. Uh, it has all been leading to this, which is spending time in San Francisco, meeting with the organizations that are interested in purchasing the service. And 
it's the number of moments both myself and the folks from KPMG who live and breathe this stuff have had like Silicon Valley moments. You know, like the TV show Silicon Valley, where it's like this was just like so much out of Silicon Valley. Has been amazing. Like a, a, amazing in, you know, in some ways in kind of hilarious ways. It's like this was just like that episode, which is just, I don't know, it's kind of a funny in a geeky way. Um, through to just some of the amazing organizations that we've met with. Companies really, really, really doing fantastic stuff. Companies that you know and that you respect, and it's I'm almost lost for words because there's just been so much work in getting to this point. Um, so much work over the last few months with KPMG, sort of trying to prepare this whole I don't even want to say organization, business, website, service, whatever we call it, to actually be presentable to these organizations. And then, of course, so much work in the five and a half years before that, actually building the thing up and turning it into what it is today. So it's it, it, it's kind of strange and, and humbling and, and daunting and exciting all at the same time to sit across the table from these organisations and talk about what Have I Been Pwned is. Um, what I will say is I've seen a bunch of stuff that's really surprised me, organisations that I, I just may not have thought of uh, as being a good fit. We've sort of had discussions, and, and afterwards, I've, I've chatted to the KPMG guys, and it's like, wow, they they were awesome. Like this was this was not what I expected going in, but they were actually sensational. And there's so much potential to do super super cool stuff. And we, we sort of run these meetings where I talk about the things that I'd like to do, and then we talk about what would have I been pwned look like in your organisation, etc. And, and some of the things I'm talking about is, look, I, I want to get a lot more data processed. You know, I keep talking about how much I've processed just in the last week, but then talking about all the stuff that's still there waiting to go. We're really going to be able to open that fire hose of data, not just all the data I'm sitting on that hasn't been processed, but all the other data that's sitting out there that hasn't yet been uh, sent to me or is not yet sitting there just waiting to have the emails regexed out and loaded in. So that there's going to be a huge amount of opportunity there. Um, I, I sort of explain it uh, and I say, look, I lament the fact that there is so much data sitting there for whom the organisations that have been breached do not know. So it's their data. They've had a data breach. It's sitting there. People are trading it. They don't know about it. And the, the reason I say I lament this is, is I hate the fact that I know this and I haven't been able to tell them. I hate the fact that there are hundreds of millions, probably billions, of different email addresses, many of them belonging to my subscribers, that are sitting there in these breaches, and I haven't been able to tell them because I haven't had the bandwidth to scale and process it. So that excites me enormously that we'll be able to do that. And then as we sort of started to talk about other capabilities and things we could build out, we said, well, there's, there are amazing ways that would really empower people like you and I who've been in data breaches to understand much more about their exposure across the internet. And I, I don't want to sort of go into much more detail about that now because this is stuff that I'll definitely be talking about in more detail later on. But I'm just super, super excited about the possibilities there. So I, uh, I've spent five days now uh, basically maxing out every available moment uh, speaking to organisations. I'm going to be spending a bunch of time next week uh, still here in San Fran doing the same thing. It's going to be probably another couple of months before I'm going to be in a position to sort of say, okay, this is where Have I Been Pwned is going to go. But this process is going fantastically. I'm just super, super excited, but as I said, like daunted and frankly a little bit tired as well. And I'm looking forward to going and grabbing that beer this afternoon <laughs> We're with, uh, with the KPNG folks because I think we all need a little bit of a rest after this. So anyway, I will update people as much as I can about that process. Uh, I will also be in Vegas, as I said before, week after this one coming. So I will be at B-Sides, Black Hat and DEF CON doing all the Vegas things. If you're around at those events, please ping me. I have got a truckload. Yes, it is almost literally a truckload of Have I Been Pwned stickers as well. And I know everyone loves the stickers, so please ping me and I'll bring you some stickers. So that's pretty much where things are at at the moment. The last thing, as I mentioned before, it's Shape Security, who is sponsoring my blog this week. They are talking about capture no longer being enough and talking about the things that they do to prevent credential stuffing attacks. And I'll tell you what, that is one really solid constant theme that's come out of these meetings as well, with organisations recognising that credential stuffing attacks are an absolute scourge of the internet 
And, and one of the things I'm really excited about is the potential we have to start getting much earlier access to data breaches, getting credentials out of that, and then actually helping organizations use those to try and block attacks. And that's obviously just one part of it, and that's separate to the ability to sort of identify your exposure on the web, and that's separate to the ability for organizations to query their domains and this sort of stuff. And you can probably sense like I'm a little bit excited about the ability to start impacting all of those things. So I think Shape Security is definitely doing a really good job with what they're doing there. Uh, and I hope that if you do have the time, you go along and check out what they do. They have been sponsoring my blog, I think, for about the last three weeks or something too. Uh, and it's just good to see someone else in the industry trying to make a positive impact on the problem that we have with credential stuffing. So with that said, I'm going to go and tune out and hopefully just try and get myself a little bit of downtime before it's beer o'clock, uh, and it is a very, very well-deserved beer o'clock this week. So thank you for watching. I hope that's a little bit of useful insight into what's going on with this whole have I been pwned process, and I will come to you next week. See ya. <laughs>